Good morning. On behalf of the consistory and deacons, we extend a warm welcome to everyone present, especially the guests and those who may be viewing via live stream. This morning's announcements are as follows. The offertory today in the morning will be for the work of the deacons in their ministry of mercy and in the afternoon for the CRWRF. Council has made the following office bearer nominations for the office of elder, Brother Graham Bartels, Michael Gracie, Nathan Hyink, Jonathan Kingma, Justin Fernandel, and James Viss. And for the office of deacon, Brothers Tyler, Blocker, and James Jantz. The election will take place, the Lord willing, in a meeting of council with the congregation directly following the morning worship service on Sunday, April 14th, 2024. The consistory joyfully announces that Adam Jeffrey Parsons, after due instruction and an interview, has requested to be baptized and profess his faith in Christ Church here in Dunville East. After this interview, Consistory has granted this brother permission to publicly profess his faith and to participate in the Lord's Supper celebrations. If there is no lawful objection brought forward, public profession of faith will take place on April 21st, 2021. We welcome Dr. Fisher to the pulpit this morning. May the Lord bless you with wisdom and give you strength for the task of proclaiming his holy word and administering the sacrament of Lord's Supper to us that we may be spiritually edified through the preaching and the use of the sacrament that our Lord's name may be glorified in our worship as we gather this day and begin a new week. It's a pleasure, brothers and sisters, to be with you and to lead you in worship this morning. May God bless and receive our worship and praise. Let us rise then for worship. As we come before the Lord, let us profess our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive God's greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing together from the words of Psalm 138, the first stanza. Brothers and sisters, every morning in our morning worship service, we usually read from the Ten Words of the Covenant as a process of self-examination as we begin to realize in our liturgical worship that we are sinners in the presence of a holy God and we receive a message of salvation and life and proceed on our ways in gratitude. Well, the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper also comprises the Ten Words of the Covenant. And so I'd like to read, first of all, from the first part of the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, page 603 and following. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In order that we may now celebrate this holy supper of our Lord to our comfort, we must first rightly examine ourselves. Further, we must use it as Christ intended it, namely to his remembrance. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness, so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart, whether he also believes the sure promise of God, that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own, as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. God will certainly receive in grace all who are thus minded and count them worthy to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to the command of Christ and of the Apostle Paul, we admonish all those who know themselves to be guilty of the following offensive sins to abstain from the table of the Lord. And we declare to them they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. And here follow the commandments, beginning with the first commandment. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone or who serve him in their own manner, the second commandment. All who abuse the name of the Lord by cursing or in any other way. All who diligently attend the worship services and who despise the proclamation of God's word or the sanctity of the sacraments. All who are disobedient to their parents or to others in authority over them. All who violate human life or cherish hatred against their neighbor and refuse to be reconciled to him. All who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure. All who by stealing, greed, or extravagance lead a worldly life. All liars, backbiters, and slanderers. Briefly, all who either in word or conduct show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. While they persist in their sins, they shall not take of this food, which Christ has ordained only for his believers. Otherwise, their judgment and condemnation will be the heavier. But all this, beloved brothers and sisters, is not meant to discourage broken and contrite hearts, as if only those who are without sin may come to the table of the Lord. For we do not come to this table to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves. On the contrary, we seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ, and in doing so, we acknowledge that we are dead in ourselves. We also are aware of many sins and shortcomings. We do not have perfect faith. We do not serve God with such zeal as he requires. Daily, we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. Yet by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are heartily sorry for these shortcomings and desire to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God. Therefore, we may be fully assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can prevent us from being received by God in grace and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. We pause there and we praise God with a psalm of self-examination, Psalm 139, verse 13.
Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, almighty and glorious God, we thank and praise your holy name for that which you do among us every Lord's Day again when we gather before you. You call us to a process of self-examination as we are to discern in our lives in the presence of a holy God the degree of sin that still lives in us, the degree of sin that still hardens in us. We pray, most gracious God, that you would indeed, by the power of your Spirit, break and soften our hearts so that indeed we seek our life, our salvation, our joy in Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray that to that end you would bless also the proclamation of your word this morning and the celebration of the Lord's Supper as we rejoice indeed with contrite hearts in the life and the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we seek indeed to follow him in all things. We pray, most gracious God, that you would work by your spirit so that more and more we may be conformed to the image of your Son and live to the glory and the praise of your holy name. And so we pray for a blessing over this worship service. We pray that you would receive our praise, our offerings, our everything as we are before you, the most holy and awesome God. We thank you, most gracious God, and we praise you because you are indeed the most important recipient of everything that we do this morning and this day. And so we pray for your blessing upon that which we offer to you. We thank you for our only merit, our only righteousness, which is not our deeds, not our performance, but the righteousness and the merit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And on that basis, we come before you. On that basis, we eat and drink. On that basis, we receive the proclamation of your word. On that basis, we look forward to a glorious and wonderful future ahead for us and all your people. And we are mindful indeed this morning as we come before you, that we come before you in the presence, in the company, in the fellowship of your people around the globe, wherever they are, wherever they worship you, wherever they give you praise and glory, wherever they conform to the truth of your holy word, most gracious God, we give you praise for them. And we pray that they and us, that we may offer to you lives of service, lives of contrite humility before you, to the praise of and glory of your name. Especially when your people are burdened, whether that be here at home, whether that be far away in faraway countries, especially when they're burdened by war and persecution and by famine and whatever else and all kinds of ruins and devastations in this world, we pray, most gracious God, that you would bless your people and that you would allow them in the midst of a world in which they see so much brokenness to see Jesus crowned with glory and honor and to know the outcome of this story, the outcome of redemptive history, when Jesus Christ will come again upon the clouds and deliver us all. Look upon us then in love. Forgive us our many sins. May the mind of Christ our Savior live in us from day to day. His love and power controlling all we do and all we say. May the love of Jesus fill us with, as the waters fill the sea, exalting, self-abasing, this is victory as we exalt him in Jesus' name alone, in the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. We'd like to read the words of our Lord Jesus in John chapter 15 in connection with the homily this morning. John 15 beginning at verse 5. The words of our Lord Jesus spoken the day of his death. Hear the word of God. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that you may be in that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and their fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. This is the word of God. We pause there, we praise God with the words of Psalm 100, stanzas 1, 2, and 4. It's a pleasure this morning to briefly proclaim to you the word of God as we find that in John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Beloved brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the gospel of our Lord Jesus contains, no doubt, many sayings of many different kinds. There are those that are given to us to set us thinking, deep words about the awesome way in which God deals with man. There are those that are given to us to get us going, commands to spur us on in our lives before God. And then there are those that are given to us to calm our hearts and give peace to our souls. No doubt the words before us this morning are of that sort. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. It's good to meditate on these words. Think about this. 
Well, we probably don't do it often enough. It's relatively easy for us to profess our love for our spouses and our children. What's harder is to prove it. What's harder is to prove it when it's really being tested. Imagine a burglar entering your home armed late at night. There is the test. Would you really prove your love and stand up to him even if it would cost you your life? Do you really love them all enough to die for them? A different scenario. It's even easier to wax eloquent, eloquently about patriotism on Canada Day or Remembrance Day or the day you became a Canadian citizen. But when war comes, you have to prove the truth of your words by possibly offering up your life. Will you do it? It's another test, isn't it? Lip service is easy. Talk is cheap until the time comes when a man is called literally to die for his country or his family. Then it is proven, and we know it for sure. It's what makes such a death even more difficult to accept because then we know it. It was, after all, driven by real love. Now apply that to our Lord Jesus Christ. This is his point. It's one thing for him to talk about his love for his friends and about how God loves his people, but those words take on new meaning and new depth when he actually dies for them, puts his life on the line, lays down his life for us. Once that has happened, the whole life of the church is driven by a contemplation of the sincerity of his great love. Greater love has no one than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. There are many aspects to this. I think especially of the fact that he uses the words lay down his life. Think about it. The act of dying is not always an act of love. Most people who die don't have a choice in the matter. If they did, they would choose life. They don't have the power to either die or to live. They do not die to show love. In too many cases, their death is only a witness to someone else's hate. But our Lord, our Lord had the power to either live or die, either to perpetuate the life he was living on this earth and to ensure that no one would take it from him or to lay it down and bring it to an end. You hear that in another passage, John 10, verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. The amazing thing is indeed, our Lord did not just suffer and die because the Father willed it or because you and I needed it and the disciples deserted him and Pilate was political and Judas plotted against him and Herod was crooked and so forth and so on. He suffered and died because he himself willed it. If he had not willed it, it would not have happened. No one takes it from me, he says. None of his enemies could have laid their hands on him, could have touched him with a single finger if he had not willed it. Put it this way, his lifeblood was not taken from him. He deliberately shed it. In every drop of blood that trickled from his hands and his feet, there was a conscious act of obedience, an act of perfect love. And then another aspect, think about who he died for. Here's a very odd thing. He dies for the sake of the very ones who put him to death. I don't think you would die for the sake of the robbers who enter your home, nor would you die for the sake of a cruel dictator who's ruining your country. But here is deep irony. He dies even willingly for the very ones who cause his death. The church, you and me. Paul must have been thinking about this passage when he wrote so wondrously in Romans 5, now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Really, you can never plumb the depths of this act of love, can you? Think about it. He didn't need this, did he? What did he gain by it? He could have walked away from it. He could have commanded a legion of angels to do away with whatever opposed him. Who was it who gained? You and me. The church. The very ones who occasioned his very death. 
So wonderful, so gracious he is that he even refers to his disciples and us as his friends. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Death and hell offered no benefit to him, but every benefit to us. Christ is the shepherd who must save the sheep whom he loves with his own life. The only way to save the sheep is for the shepherd to give his own life. And that's what he does. The ones who gain from this are you and me. He sees us in his love. He loves us in his grace and lays down his life in all his loving grace. Later this afternoon, I hope to preach also in my home church about Lord's Day 5 and 6. It's about Jesus as the mediator. And this is an odd mediator even. Because you know what happens with a media? If you do mediation, you get two people who don't get along. What do you do? You talk to the one, and then you try to hear his side of the story, and then you talk to the other and hear his side of the story, and you try to mediate. But Jesus is the mediator between us and God. And what does he do? What a mediator never would do. He lays down his life, because this is the only way. Would you do that to bring together two brothers? or brother and sister, or whatever? Would you do that? Lay down your life? Have yourself slaughtered for that sake? No, but this is Jesus. Full of compassion, full of mercy, full of love, he lays down his life for us in this process of mediation. And then there's still another thought, and that is this. Did you notice how around this text our Lord is talking about how we too need to love each other? Verse 12, my command is this, love one another as I have loved you. He brings up the bar when he shows us in 13 how much he has loved us. Verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another for the purpose that you will love one another. What does this have to do with our text? What's the connection? It's this. When our Lord Jesus performs this wondrous act of love, in which he lays down his life for us, he forever makes the church a, communication, a community that will be characterized and driven by the love of Christ. Here we are brought into the secret of how this happens. You can't just legislate love. Mom and dad don't make their home a loving place by issuing new rules and giving new orders and legislation. They make it a haven in which love rules when they display that love themselves. Said one man, the command to love is given by one who has himself done everything that love can do. When a mother loves a child, she creates the context in which the child is free to love her in return. When a ruler really does love his or her subjects, and when this becomes clear by generous and warm-hearted actions, he creates a context in which the subjects can and will love in return. Jesus can, can issue the command that we are to love one another and so to remain in his love because he has acted out and will act out the greatest thing that love can do. Christianity is a personal relationship of love and loyalty to the one who has loved us more than we can ever begin to imagine. And the test of that love and loyalty remains the simple, profound, dangerous, and difficult command, love one another as I have loved. Here is the test of whether we've thought long and hard about Jesus' love. Is there anyone with whom we are living in a relationship of enmity and hatred? Are there grudges in the Christian community, in this church? If there are, it's back to the cross, back to our Lord. He so loved that you would so love. Every Lord's Supper is such a testimony to Christ's love that it's true. If you live in hatred, you should not eat, you should not drink. First go and be reconciled, says Jesus. These are tough times, brothers and sisters. Everywhere we turn, someone else is being affected by cancer and by what have you. Your life is fragile. The world is a fragile place in so many ways. Also when it comes to hatred, there's way too much hatred in this world. We, as the people of God, are not meant to add to that at all, but to subtract from it because of the love and the sacrifice of Christ. And in the middle of all of that, we are urged to eat and drink and celebrate. And we have reason to, no doubt, wonderful reason, 
the head of the church, the ruler of the nations, the one who controls everything from above today, loves us with a great and wonderful love. He has proven it, proven it so wonderfully. Power in the hands of a hateful man is a terrible thing, but, but power in the hands of one who loves, that is delightful and that is comforting. So eat and drink and love and give thanks because you are loved. Our prayer today is that as we lift the bread and drink the cup, we might be so full of faith in his surpassing worth that no danger would ever hold us back from the fullest and most radical obedience to all that he's commanded us, that nothing would keep us from loving him and loving each other forever. Amen. We praise God together with the words of Psalm 63, stanzas 2 and 3. continue reading the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper as we find that now on page 604. This morning we also welcome to the Lord's Supper John and Tessa Siebinga who come to us from the Abbotsford Canadian Reformed Church. Let's read together the rest of the form. Let us now consider for what purpose the Lord has instituted his supper, namely that we should use it in remembrance of him. We are to remember him in the following manner. First of all, let us fully trust that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world according to the promises made from the beginning to the fathers in the Old Testament and that he assumed our flesh and blood. From the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth, he bore for us the wrath of God under which he should have, we should have perished eternally. By his perfect obedience, he has for us fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. We remember in particular that the weight of the wrath of God caused by our sins pressed out of him sweat like drops of blood falling on the ground in the garden of Gethsemane. There he was bound that he might free us from our sins. 
He suffered countless insults that we might never be put to shame. Though innocent, he was condemned to death that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God. He even let his blessed body be nailed to the cross that he might cancel the bond which stood against us because of our sins. By all this, he has taken our curse upon himself that he might fill us with his blessing. On the cross, he humbled himself in body and soul to the very deepest shame and anguish of hell. And he called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me that we might be accepted by God and never more be forsaken by him? Finally, by his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace, when he said, It is finished. In order that we may firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his last Passover, instituted the Holy Supper. He gave the bread and the cup to his disciples in remembrance of him. He taught us to understand that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded and assured of his hearty love and faithfulness towards us. It is a sure pledge that he has given his body and shed his blood for us. Otherwise, we would have suffered eternal death. He nourishes and refreshes our hungry and thirsty souls with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life as certainly as this bread is broken before our eyes and this cup is given to us and we eat and drink in remembrance of him. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross. It is the only ground for our salvation. Thereby he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has removed the cause of our eternal hunger and misery, which is sin, and obtained for us the life-giving spirit. By this spirit who dwells in Christ as the head and in us as his members, we have true communion with him and share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness, and glory. By the same spirit, we are also united in true brotherly love as members of one body. For the Apostle Paul says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. As one bread is baked out of many grains and one wine is pressed out of many grapes, so we all, incorporated in Christ by faith, are together one body. For the sake of Christ, who so exceedingly loved us first, we shall now love one another and shall show this to one another, not just in words, but also in deeds. Finally, Christ has commanded us to celebrate the Holy Supper until he comes. We receive at his table a foretaste of the abundant joy which he has promised and look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb. When he will drink the wine new with us in the kingdom of his Father, let us rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming. May the Almighty Heavenly God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive all this, let us now humble ourselves before God in prayer and call upon him in true faith. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in this supper we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we may entrust ourselves more and more to your son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our contrite hearts may be nourished with his true body and blood. Yes, with him who is the only heavenly bread, that we may not live in our sins, but Christ in us and we in him. Let us so truly be partakers of the new and everlasting testament, the covenant of grace, that we do not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, never more imputing to us our sins, but providing us with all things for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may take up our cross joyfully deny ourselves, and confess our Savior. Let us in all tribulation await our Lord Jesus Christ, who will come from heaven to change our mortal body to be like his glorious body and take us to himself forever. Hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now profess our Catholic undoubted Christian faith. We do so this morning by reciting the Apostles' Creed together. Let everyone say with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in order that we may now be nourished with Christ, the true heavenly bread, we must not cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but lift our hearts on high in heaven, where Christ our advocate is, at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit, as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. Before the bread and wine is distributed, let us praise God's name with the words of hymn 59, the first stanza. bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ.
bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion of the blood of Christ.
The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take, drink from it, all of you. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. If we want to talk about the love of God in Christ, the love of Christ our Lord, there's another central text, of course, in John 3, verse 16. We read from John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Let us rejoice together as we sing the words of hymn 62, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Beloved in the Lord, since the, now, since the Lord has now nourished our souls at his table, let us together praise his holy name. Let everyone say in his heart, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pits, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Therefore my heart and my mouth shall proclaim the praise of the Lord from now on and forevermore. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. 
Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in your boundless mercy you have given us your only begotten Son as our mediator. We praise you that he is the sacrifice for our sins and our food and drink to life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith through which we may share in such great benefits. Through your Son, you have instituted the Holy Supper for the strengthening of our faith. We earnestly ask you, faithful God and Father, that by your Holy Spirit this celebration may lead to our daily increase in true faith and fellowship with Christ, your beloved Son. Most gracious God, we thank and praise your holy name for the message and the heart of the gospel. It's while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, far away from you, that you came into our life and changed us and altered us and offered us even the peace of the blood of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, most gracious God, that we today can celebrate that love, the love that you have given to us, Lord Jesus, the love you, that you have loved us with, and the love that you, O oh Father, also have loved us with as you sacrificed even your only Son. We thank you, O oh Holy Spirit, for the work that you do and for the way in which you cultivate that love in us, and we pray that you may continue to cultivate it in us so that we, in turn, may love you abundantly and love you endlessly and at the same time love each other as we really ought because our Lord Jesus Christ has shown us the way. May we live not in hatred, not in enmity, but in all things and with everyone out of love and love alone. In so far as it depends upon us, help us to be at peace with everyone. Most gracious God, we pray for your blessing upon us in all things. We remember those who have special needs among us, those who struggle with illnesses, those who struggle with difficulties in their lives, whatever the difficulties may be. Surround them with your care. May they have a sense of your love, your nearness, your goodness, and your grace. We remember this morning before you also the camp and family, and we pray that you would be with Ryan and Esther, with Reverend and Mrs. Campen as they go about this time in their lives when they need to care for young Jared. We remember before you the fact that the surgery scheduled for tomorrow has been postponed, and we pray for peace and patience for the family as they wait the day and as they wait the next stage in his life. We pray that you would bless Jared in every possible way, with health, with well-being, with joy and enthusiasm before you, most gracious God. Surround this family, surround all our families with your care and love, especially when it comes to the lives of children who seem to us and are really to us and to, to all of us so very helpless of themselves. They need us, and so we pray, may we not disappoint. May you be our faithful example, the way you have loved your son and cared for your son, and your son in turn has loved you and has loved us. May you be an example to us as we go about our family lives, wherever we are, whatever stage we are at. Most gracious God, be gracious to us. Remember before you this morning also the cause of the seminary as the end of the season comes near and as the students need to prepare for examinations, we pray for your blessing upon them. Also in this spring when there is a flurry of activity also in the churches as students submit themselves to classical examinations and students get ready to prepare for to become eligible for the ministry of the word, we pray for a blessing over this process once again and that you would continue to supply us with young men who are full of energy and enthusiasm for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the well-being of the, your people, for the praise of your glorious name. Most gracious God, look upon us in love and mercy and also in these things. Bless also the process of election of office bearers. We pray, lay, lay this matter also before you and pray that you would be gracious and that you would lead your church even in these things so that we can see later on also your hand in our lives and your hand in our community. Look upon us in grace, forgive us our sins, and bless us in this day in all things, for we ask it in Jesus' name alone. Amen. After the offerings, we praise God's name with the words of Psalm 136, stanzas 1 and 2.
Receive now God's blessing and go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.